Welcome back, everyone, to Vox Markets. My name is Paul Hill, and I'm delighted today to be able to speak to Ken Wooten of Gresham House, one of the UK's smartest uh, small and micro cap investors. So, uh, welcome, Ken. Thanks, Paul. Nice to be here. Yeah, well, um, despite sort of um, the Delta variant, the markets have continued to march higher, largely on the back of strong corporate earnings and ongoing central bank support. But most investors at the moment seem to be all sort of leaning on the same <laughs> bullish side of the boat. And uh, I was really wondering what, what your view of top level of equities going forward and the sweet spot in particular sort of like for Gresham in, in small and micro caps. Yeah, I, I think... You're absolutely right. There's been a phenomenal recovery and probably not one which most people would have predicted sort of uh, you know, the, in, in the dark days of February and March last year. Um, and I think the, the backdrop you've got to remember is that the UK equity market has been, have been out of favour with, with asset allocators for you know five years. It was ever since, ever since the Brexit referendum result in 2016. Um, and then, so trading at big discounts to, to other developed markets, including particularly the US. Um, and then you've also got UK smaller companies as a result of the kind of, I guess, risk off on UK, which have been trading at perpetual discounts to larger companies. So in the area we focus on, we've been saying for a you know, considerable period of time, this whole asset class is, is really cheap. There's loads of you know, interesting opportunities here. You've then seen the sort of big recovery, you know, and then accelerated by the vaccine news last November. That's been fantastic, but you know that's that's not closed the discount that we've seen. So we still think you know, the, the asset class and the the area of UK small companies is is still attractively valued, and you know, there are pockets of overvaluation, um, and and the way the recovery has has sort of come through in the stock market has not been even. There's been some. You know, COVID winners have done fantastically well and people have kind of driven some of those stocks you know, through momentum to, to big premium valuations. But there's whole swathes of the, the sort of you know, the rest of the economy where particularly where there's been short term economic impact, where we just think you've got really attractive valuations from a long term perspective. So you know, we're, we're certainly seeing lots of opportunities still. Yeah, I would agree. And also, I guess with the small cap era or the micro cap era, they're more sensitive to economic change. And if we're still seeing central banks to be pretty supportive and continued reopening trade, then they should benefit even more than so than I guess the larger caps, which are more fully priced as well. Yeah, I think that you've got you've got that that impact, and then you've also got just um, you know, the, the the kind of relative value. Trade, which you know, going back to what I was saying before, yeah. so you, you, you and, and you, you know, that is being validated by the elevated level of takeover activity we're seeing at the moment, particularly uh, from from private equity. So you know, the, the, there there are sort of focused buyers, focused on particular sectors who are seeing really attractive uh, value opportunities in high quality UK small companies. Well, it's not just small companies; it's large companies as well. But yeah, so, so you know, I think that, that 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 kind of spate of takeovers is really sort of you know, evidencing what we've been saying for a while, which is the UK looks cheap, so hence sort mm. of large cap takeover offers, but also the UK small caps in particular. And, and um, you know, we, we've had a number of takeover approaches across, across various of our portfolios over the course of the last few months. Um, you know, some, sometimes that's great because the valuation, you, know, you get a short term valuation uplift and in, in some businesses, you know, we're, we're sort of happy to see them go. And in other cases, that's frustrating because you know, they're, they're businesses that we think you know, have good long term prospects and the short term uplift is nice, but it doesn't sort of compensate you for what you're losing in terms of opportunity over the next sort of three to five years. Yeah. Well, I guess it gives you plenty of money then to invest into sort of new opportunities, whether existing in the secondary market, but also in the IPO market. And that seems, yeah. certainly the latter seems to be on the sort of a bit of a crest of a wave. And I have noticed some of the stocks you've been putting, um, mm -hmm. the, yeah, the, 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 the money that you, the, the spare cash. And one was uh, sort of just recently, Silver Bullet Data Service. I mean, that's quite a bold title for a company. Yeah. Do you want to take us through that one? At well, all? They're, they're, I, they're, didn't know, I didn't know it ever existed as Silver Bullet, but obviously they're, it does. They're, 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 they're in the marketing services industry, so I guess they're, they're sort of you know, they're paid to, to come up with Yeah, of course, they come up with good sort of catchy titles. Yeah, so look, this Silver, Silver Bullet, really exciting business, pretty small, but you know, it's in the, the sort of advertising technology digital marketing space. Um, it's a consultancy business, um, but it's also got a technology platform called 4D Tech, which is a uh, sort of contextual 
advertising platform which allows advertisers to, in, to do two things really. One is to um, ensure that when they place a digital ad you know, in an automated way, it's not being placed next to something which is going to threaten their brand. So yeah, it's, okay. it's kind of you know, really important for blue chip companies to, to make sure they know that their, their brand integrity is not being damaged by, by, by where their ads being served. Um, but, but that same technology allows them to then also be really targeted about how they place the, place the ad and kind of the, the context in terms of what that individual who sees it, it has been looking at or where, it's, or where, where they currently are and where they've been. And, the, and, and they can do that in a way which uh, you know, has, it, it works using first party data, which means sort of in the environment where, where cookies are no longer sort of, uh, um, being supported by some of the big platforms, you know, their technology still really works. In fact, it has a, has a distinct advantage. So yeah. um, we think that, that it's the combination of a profitable services business uh, with a really attractive customer list, and then this relatively nascent but really exciting and sort of made for the modern, modern kind of the, the, the current era uh, tech business. You know, that, that the risk reward is really, really attractive. And you've got, you know, we, we were an early investor in Martin Sorrell's S4 Capital. Oh, um, okay. So you've done well there. <laughs> yeah, but, but, but you know, we've, we've done that. We've, we've fully exited that now because it's sort of obviously gone to, to be quite a big company now. But, um, you know, Sir so Martin has sort of been evangelizing for this whole idea of first party data and post, post cooking environment. I think S4 is a, an interesting, sort of much smaller way to play that same theme. Yeah. And I guess with that sort of like the tech enabled, it means it's scalable as well. You don't just have bums on seats. You can get the operating leverage, can't you? And if you, yeah, yeah, Absolutely. yeah. Absolutely. Another an, another one was, um, well, I think it's called is it Seraphine, which is basically yeah. does sort of um, yeah d does um, sort of outfits, maternity outfits and nurses mm -hmm. outfits and stuff. I yeah. guess not not for stag dudes. They're sort of like workwear <laughs> and stuff. Yeah. Well, I I, I, I remember you know, when when I have my so my wife was pregnant with our first baby a few years ago and, and we went to, to one of their physical stores well so, uh, so i recognized the brand when they came sort of doing their pre-marketing yeah. yeah it's 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 a multi-channel retail but it's mainly the vast majority of revenues are online so it's, it's mainly an e-commerce player it's it's international um and you know, as, as you said it's it's a, a apparel uh, retail but specifically for the maternity market it's a market which is being quite poorly served by traditional mm. retail, um, and and they focus specifically on it. And so their you know, the, the, their designers are trying to make you know, stylish but practical clothes for for, for, for pregnant ladies. And yeah. um, it's international in scope, so there's a big market opportunity. And they're probably one of the best management teams that I've seen in, in for, for quite a long time in a new business. So a really really dynamic CEO, extremely data driven. And you know, really got a very strong handle on the, the customer economics of of of, uh, of, of, their, of that demographic they're targeting, and because it's you know, it's a it's a niche, but it's a yeah. big niche uh, that they're they're managing to grow you know, forty percent year on year uh, with really really attractive profit margins. Because the other thing about the segment is, you know, actually it's a necessary purchase uh, at, at that point in a, in a person's sort of life oh. and. You know, they're, they're less price sensitive in, in, in uh, at that point. Good so point, yeah. Mar margins are attractive, growth rates are attractive, management team are good quality, and you know we think it's got exciting, exciting prospects. Who do they compete against? Is there like some mother care? Is it and people like no, that? No, no, some... it, it's quite a fragmented. Um, yeah. Sort of space. So yeah, they're, they're competing against you know a certain sort of small number of SKUs that that more traditional retailers have. They're competing with people. Like mother care, but who are doing a lot more, and they're not, it's not just about the mm. That's just one small bit of what they do. Um, so there's no there's no global e-commerce led uh, sort of specific category leader in that area. So there's a big opportunity for them to to to, to really drive that opportunity. And you know, so they're benefiting from the channel shift in general in apparel retail, but then you know, also sort of being being very specialist in that space. Yeah. Uh, it gives them a really attractive opportunity and, and you know whilst you know there is a finite sort of lifetime of a customer for it during a pregnancy and immediately afterwards you know, the chances are those people will come back and they have a good experience when you know if and when they have another baby hmm. so a category killer basically and they're you know it's an own brand it's, it's, it's their own brand as well they don't resell other stuff yeah, is it? so uh, yeah. good. another category killer is it's a similar sort of thing but it's in mental health it's cooth and i know 
I know sort of like the, the Royals and Prince William have been championing mental health and lots of sort of like mm -hmm. famous sports people. So it's really yeah. caught the attention of the public and has been, the problem has been exacerbated during the lockdowns, hasn't it? Yeah. As I, do you want to take us through this one? Because I think it came to the market earlier this year and or sorry, last, late last year. That's and right, it's yeah. specifically sort of helping sort of the children in the NHS, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Which honestly, unfortunately, uh, you know, I've really suffered because of lack of schooling and face-to-face -face tuition. Yeah, look, I think in, in a in an environment where you know, ESG you know, sort of, uh, credentials are increasingly important in front of mind, I think this is this is a relatively rare opportunity to invest in business, which is really doing yeah really good stuff in the S part of, of ESG. Yeah. Um, you know, so it, it's a leader in in provision of digital mental health. Sort of service, uh, tech and services is selling into the NHS mainly um, on, on a regional basis and is providing a, an online platform which provides resources and 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 support for mm. ch mainly children and young people they are moving into adult um, where they can where they can sort of find find resources to help them with if they've got a particular problem um, and uh, if, if that problem is acute then they've got the opportunity to uh, access live uh, online counselling in an anonymized fashion uh, in a sort of text-based format, but speaking to real uh, accredited, sort of NHS accredited um, counsellors. So, you know, it, it's the, the idea of it is that if you intervene early on in in a sort of someone's mental health deterioration journey, then you know the the clinical outcome is likely better, so they're less likely to sort of become an acute case later on. Um, and then from the NHS's point of view. It's a lot cheaper to to serve. You know, the, the the outcomes are better, but it's also a lot cheaper from a resource percent perspective to uh, deal with someone in a relatively early stage of, of of their issues rather than have an acute case sort of ending up in hospitalisation yeah. later. So you know, it's doing good stuff, as you say earlier. The lockdown and COVID have you know, have really exacerbated the need for for this kind of service, um, you know, and they're in the right place at the, at the right time, sort of providing a. You know, a, a, a sort of fully integrated service for, for in, into the NHS in, in that area. It's also you know, pre-COVID, mental health in particular, but also sort of specifically digital provision within that uh, were were identified as a key strategic priority for the NHS. Obviously mm. pre-COVID, pre which has kind of taken over, but I think you know as as we return to normal, that that will sort of, you know, and as the the amount of resource focused specifically on on dealing with COVID cases. It starts to recede, then uh, this this again will kind of become more of a priority. Yeah, I think telemedicine is just going to go one way, isn't it? It's just going to get enormous because it, it's hugely more efficient and actually much better service for the patient because they haven't yeah. got to book you know book an appointment, go and see the GP, then go and see a consultant. They can do it all at the touch of a button, and it saves the NHS a lot of time. Is there an international opportunity here if they become yeah, a sort so of like? So they're all, they're also so so the the, the additional growth. So they're they're not in every uh, CCG in the, the NHS in the UK. So there's an opportunity to expand their sort of geographical footprint. Mm. Um, but and, you know, and, and then to and then to to serve more people in those communities. Um, but then the other growth angles are international, um, which they is you know, they are, they are trying to exploit though though it's fairly nascent at the moment. Um, then into adult. Uh, um, mental health, which is fairly poorly served and, and yeah. in the NHS, um, and then lastly into corporate wellness. So mm. particularly in, in, into so their service being bundled as part of a, a corporate kind of uh, medical insurance package that they give as, as, as uh, benefits to their to their employees. So you know, that that bit is you know, there's more competition in that market, but you know they, they've got a, a differentiated angle and. Um, and, and the margins are higher in that area because it actually doesn't not, it doesn't get taken up quite as much, so the utilisation yeah. is less. Um, so lots of different sort of areas where they can potentially grow, but the core NHS business, I think, is they've got, got a good few years of growth left in it still. Yeah. Well, I, I, it sounds like one stock that could be 
taken out by somebody else because uh, I think the the granddaddy of the industry is Teledoc out in the States, which is mm. trading on around over 10 times sales. So uh, there's plenty of sort of opportunity in that whole area. Now, another yeah. one which I, I, I spoke to Andy Ruff on, actually, which he invested in, was called Music Magpie. And when I heard about it, I thought, yeah. is this something to do about a robber taking sort of like, you know, stealing digital music? But it's nothing to do with it, isn't it? It's basically refurbishing and reselling consumer mm. electronics such as yeah. mobile phones and that sort of stuff yeah so so this again is the, in, in in the sort of uh, on the theme vsg this is a, a sort of you know, had, yeah. had a, strong, a strong environmental credentials this, this huge is, yeah that, that kind of theme of re-commerce where yes um you know you're not just buying something consuming it and chucking it away and buying a new one and uh, you know, take you know, taking the advantage of everyone you know probably most people who listen to this call will um yeah, we'll, we'll have one one or more devices sort of stuck in a drawer from from uh, which yeah, I've already, I've I've got three as it is anyway. <laughs> oh yeah, you should. Well, you should get 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 some yeah, music magpie. Get on the phone for music magpie and and uh, you get some cash for them. Or, or, yeah, or you're right. You can go, increasingly, you can go down to Asda and you can uh, they they've they've started investing in this uh, kiosk that they've, they've sort of partnered with Asda to yeah. where you can basically go scan the phone. Um, it'll give you a price immediately, and if you uh, um, and, it, and if you decide to sell, it, then within ten minutes the cash is in your bank account. So mm. the, the 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 story really is there's an increasing demand for for reconditioned uh, mobile phones where people don't want to spend a thousand pound plus on the latest iPhone anymore because the the previous generation is still pretty good pretty good phone. Yeah. And, and you know, people want to buy phones for their children, but they don't want to necessarily fork out that kind of uh, amount of cash and people are increasingly buying the device separately to the contract so yeah, you know, there's I mean, they do other things is the ipads and and, and laptops etc as well but the main the main driver of the business is, is mobile phones and particularly apple iphones where they're a sort of accredited partner of apple um and you know there's the, the, the really exciting part of the story is they're shifting from being a transactional led business where they buy a phone and they sell it again at a margin to uh, in, to renting the phones and increasingly sort of bundling that with with uh, reselling the airtime packages as well. So they're sort of uh, on on the trajectory to ultimately become like an MVNO, but with yeah. a really attractive acquisition model to get the to get the devices at an attractive price. And then you know, the rental model means that they've got a recurring revenue stream, which is much better visibility and quality of earnings than than just a transactional model. So you know, yeah. we're, we're again really really excited about the opportunity here. They're, they're uh, they've launched in the US as well a couple of years ago, and so that that's a, a smaller business now in the UK business, but you know with a huge growth opportunity there as well. And there's no no real dominant players in that in in, in either mm. market, UK or US. And um, how competitive is this space? Because there's a, there was has been in the past some you know old businesses that used to do some of this, but never have sort of like an end to end service really slick. Yeah, really. And, and, and a lot of the businesses used to uh, that you, you might be referring to. Yeah, people like Regenesis and so yes. they, they were getting the phones. They were typically buying them um, from the operators when when they got them when when they when they got them. That's back correct. The um, and then they were doing the reverse logistics, and ultimately they would sell the, the phones into the, into sort of developing countries where you know, perhaps the yeah the, the the latest ones weren't sort of quite quite so in demand. Uh, that this is this is all about in market. So this is this is now kind of capturing the trend that people don't. They don't want to kind of get the latest phone and sell sell their old one to somewhere in Africa. It's it's, it's you know the iPhone 10 is still a great phone, even mm. if it's an iPhone 13 about to be launched sort of uh, in, in in the short yeah. term. So um, yeah, I, I think it's really it's really capitalising on that trend, you know, particularly from millennials to go. We we just don't you know, we want to buy reconditioned stuff now because it's better for the environment and we can still get a get get a good product. Yeah, well, I mean, and also to a certain extent, it's such that if you do need, want a new phone, then uh, because of the chips shortage at the moment, it's quite difficult to get a, a brand new device. So getting a really good reconditioned one is probably a, a good sort of second alternative. Now, just moving on, another one, Active Ops, which yeah. I think is done sort of, it's a sort of management of sort of like automation of back office systems yeah. into the sort of like the financial services industry mm -hmm. that seems to yeah. be growing you know, pretty well. And actually, there was, I mean, just as another, we talked about MA. I don't know if you saw yesterday, but um, 
uh, Blue Prism got a couple of uh, private equity approaches. So it seems to be a, yeah. this whole area seems to be getting a lot of attraction, you know, a, 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 a attraction for uh, for people to. Yeah, to we, 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 we think this is a really attractive area. This, this kind of whole uh, uh, area of, of, you know, automation, back, back mm. office process automation, um, just to drive efficiency, but also to drive sort of better best of customer outcomes so kind of linking front office yeah. and back office more more effectively um and active ops is a business we've tracked for a number of years prior to it becoming yeah, becoming a public company um and we've made uh, my, my colleagues who, who do private equity investing at gresham uh, that they, they they invested in a business in that sort of ro robotic process automation space yes um, called symphony which is a is actually a consultancy that was advising companies on how they could implement things like Blue Prism or Automation mm. Anywhere or any of the, those RPA uh, software solutions. Um, so the, they, did, they did very well out of that investment. Um, I've also historically had an investment in EG Solutions, which was a, a small oh, okay. company, which, you know, which was a direct competitor of ActiveOps. And so we knew ActiveOps. That's um, Elizabeth Gooch, wasn't it, if I remember Elizabeth rightly? Gooch. Yeah, correct. Yeah. So yeah, we were a long, long standing big shareholder in that, in that business. And ultimately we exited that. Um, it, was, it was sold to Behrens, the, the mm. NASDAQ listed um, business. And yeah, we, we, we did well out of that investment. But you know, a number of the people who were involved with Elizabeth, uh, uh, E.g., are now uh, active ops, including their, their the head of sales. Right. Um, you know, the, the, the former chairman of E.g. was was chairman of active ops for a while. So we kind of knew the business um, you know, for, for for a number of years prior to it coming to market. Um, yeah, we still think this is a really attractive area with a with a strong tailwind. And you mentioned Blue Prism. I mean, that's so 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 um, you know, that that's a business we haven't invested in because you know, we like profitable businesses that are. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, where, the, where, the, where the market opportunity is pro proven and where um, you know, we, we can sort of touch and feel the economics properly. And yeah, okay. Blue Prism is a fantastic sort of high growth area, but you know, it, it was a business that was burning a lot of cash and, and, and wasn't profitable and still isn't. And you know, in fact, after it listed, it sort of burned even more cash than it burned, burned before. Yeah. So you know, you know, we missed out on a good return there, but for every one of those fantastic Blue Prism stories, there's a lot of early stage businesses that ultimately kind of don't work or need to be recapitalized a number of times. So uh, with active ops, you know, it's fundamentally a profitable business. It's reinvesting the profits to, 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 to grow into customer, into marketing, customer acquisition. But you know, we, we've done a lot of work to sort of understand the, 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 how, how the economic model works. And we just think this is a you know, great growth story, you know, which ultimately, if it's successful, will, will, will probably be a takeover over target at some point. Yeah. I don't, I don't know, there's, there's a big sort of like uh, data point, isn't there, out in the States? I think it, it's a competitor for Blue Prism. I can't remember what it's called. Is it is it IO Path or you, you IPath? Yeah. yeah. And, and that's, last time I saw, they listed an, an IPO at something like 30 times sales and, and was still valued at that compared to Active Ops on five times sales. So uh, yeah. it, does, yeah. it does show you what the upside is if it can, uh, if it can hit its stripes there. Exactly. Um, now, just moving on to some recent follow-on purchases. Obviously, you know you've got you've had a lot of money to spend, so uh, you've done rather well. Another one was um, was Angling Direct, which has been a bit of a winner, I think, mm -hmm. of sort of COVID. And I guess the opportunity here is to sort of like to scale it and lift um, gross margins a bit higher, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we invested in Active uh, not Active so Angling Direct. Angling Direct. <laughs> Gave my A's mixed up. Um, <laughs> in Angli in Angling Direct. Probably three years ago. Yeah, um, and you know at that point we liked e-commerce and multi-channel retail, but there weren't really many sort of small caps that, that we felt were valued at at a level which yeah. we could rationalise. There's a yeah. few more now. Some of some of the recent IPO activity has increased the supply of some interesting niche niche e-commerce players. But Angling Direct, you know, it, it's it's a multi-channel channel retailer, so it's got physical stores. And it's rolling those out as well as having a, 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 a well developed e commerce uh, proposition. It's about 50 50 in terms of revenue between mm. e com and, and, and physical stores. But it's in a category where multi channel really works, where actually people, enthuse, they're enthusiasts, the customers are, are hobbyists. They, yeah. they love, they love the sport of fishing. So, they, so going to a physical store where they can speak to an expert, where they can actually sort of handle the gear and try stuff out, that's, that's, Actually, really an important part of the of, of, of the, the customer journey. So, sounds like sounds like Games Workshop. 
Yeah, no, well, well, and it's funny you say that because that, that's exactly what I thought when I when I met Angry Direct was, you know, people are going to laugh at me when I say that, but this is like Games Workshop. It's just yeah. in, in different category because there's a hell of a lot of people who love fishing. They're enthusiasts. Yes. So, so, you know, I'm not saying they're not price sensitive, but they are the lifetime value of a customer is is really attractive because they keep coming back they want more want more stuff they you know and there's also a consumable element to it because you have to buy the buy the fishing tackle and the bait and everything so mm. it is you know there's a reason to come back and then there's a sort of hook to be able to to, to, to <laughs> no to pun that. intended yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but the, the business had been you know it, it i guess it was run by founders and it was you know, it, they've done a fantastic job in building up a, a good market position. It's the leader in the UK, but it, you know, it, it probably there was a lot of opportunity for them to run the business more efficiently and just with, a, particularly on the e-commerce side, just to 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 put in some best practices in terms of how they how they manage that. And so there's the new management team came in about two years ago. Um, you know, they had a bit of a baptism of fire because they're not they weren't long in the job before COVID hit, and they kind of had a a lot of firefighting to do but i think they did a brilliant job of of, of navigating that really tricky period and, and fortunately for them you know, fishing was a, a you, know, you were allowed to, in the evening the first yeah straight then, away weren't you, you were fa- fairly early on they were allowed to do it again and they, the, the e-commerce business meant that they even when people couldn't go to a physical store they could still buy buy product and you know i i see this you know if it did you know, a tenth as well as as uh, as games workshop it, it, it has done it will be a fantastic investment. I think this, this is an international opportunity. They've got you know, presence in Central Europe in terms of their, their e-commerce proposition. Um, mm. Leader in the UK, it's a fragmented market, um, and there's just a lot of growth opportunity and, and, and a lot of self-help opportunities to improve margins. So, you know, I, I'm genuinely really excited. We're, I think we're the largest shareholder, or the largest non-management shareholder in the, in the company. And, you know, I, I I think over the next three to five years, it's got a fantastic growth opportunity. Yeah, it's, it's on a cheap valuation. It's only about half time sales. I say yeah, 0.5. Yeah, exactly. And if he can lift margins, I mean, that's going only one way, which is up. And it seems he's got a, a lot of cash as well to sort of like to, you know, to, 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 to carry on yeah, with the growth. You know, they they did, a, did a, a sort of precautionary uh, equity raise during last year because mm. of you know, the, the impact, uncertainty around the impact of COVID. But actually, you know, they're also rolling out stores, albeit that they don't take that much. Cap, capital into, into the source of their, their sort of out of town locations. Um, that you know, I think business is really well capitalized to, you know, one of the things they've they've said they're aspiring to do is uh, potentially acquire within within the EU. Um, yeah. so there, are, there are a number of opportunities. No, there's no large players in any of the markets. So you know, mm. they, they would have to buy a relatively small player and then sort of build on it organically. But you know, we'd be supportive of you know them making the right acquisition in 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 Europe because you know, then they get they can sort of put the some warehousing in Europe and that kind of reduces logistics costs and so the economics of the econ business in in Europe would, would improve as a result of that as well. Yeah, and then uh, three other sort of like recent sort of like purchases made are all in the sort of the asset management, wealth management, sort of pension. So you got okay. you got XP Pensions, Mattioli Woods, and yeah. uh, and Fintel as well. I mean, I'm guessing. I mean, there's masses of consolidation going off on this whole sector, and um, also given the the democratization of sort of like you know investing and Robin Hood and the amount of money being put into the market on an individual DIY etc. Yeah. Uh, rather than actually you know, just perhaps, you know, rather going on the active side, then it, this whole area is really sort of taken off. In fact, it's going through a lot of a uh, lot of change and disruption. Yeah, there's, there's, there's been, you know, we're now several years after the sort of big regulatory changes in, in, uh, yeah. in, with, with, with the retail distribution review, et cetera, a, a few years ago. Um, and the whole... Sector, RDR, that, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that, that's, that's a few years ago now, but... It, but They've made a big fundamental change to the business model yes. of the sector, um, and then you, you've also had, as you as you point out, this kind of pension freedom. Yes, and, and the CMA the, wasn't it, and they yeah. they were concerned there was an oligopoly, and they changed the they improved the competition. I think. Yeah, so, so there's that there's that. I mean, anyway, there's, there's been a lot going on in the sector, um, but the the main driver is is you know, increasing amounts of of investable wealth. And more control over that wealth by by mm. individuals, and, and therefore the requirement for advice, and that's that's driven the growth in a whole host of different businesses. And it's a fragmented industry; it's, it's a huge industry. Um, 
but there's also a lot of consolidations going on in that, in that space. Yes. And, 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 and private equity and public publicly listed platforms uh, sort of trying to acquire businesses to, to drive scale. Um, and the businesses you mentioned are sort of diff, different plays on, on a similar mm. theme, really. Uh, uh, Mattioli Woods is uh, its origins were as a as a pensions advisor to people with with SIPs and and yeah. status that typically sort of higher net worth individuals. And they've they've evolved from that over the last number. We've been an investor in it for oh, gosh, like thirteen years, I think. I've, 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 owned, I've owned the shares, um, and it's it's evolved from that sort of specialist pensions advisory mm. administration business into into building a, a substantial wealth management business. And yeah, um, but 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 still, so sort of the linchpin being the, the trusted advisor for those for those higher net worth individuals. So you know it, it's it's growing organically, but it's also grown by acquisition. And, and you know, I, I, I'd rate the, the management team as you know, one of the best in the industry, and they've done a fantastic job over a, a, a number of years of acquiring businesses, getting the, the cultural fit right, mm. and then integrating those businesses to, to, to drive scale, and then also growing those businesses after they've acquired them. Um, they, they, you know, we, we, we did a follow-on investment into them earlier on this year when they did a big fundraising to acquire um, Maven, which is a sort of yes, a, a, an asset management sort of, uh, I guess, product manufacturing business. And then Ludlow, which is another uh, sort of advisory wealth management business. So um, you know they're, they're growing on a number of fronts and and trying to bring in house sort of product capability as well as as well as sort of selling selling and advising on third parties. So you know, it, I, I think it's just a huge market, good team, very fragmented. So just an ongoing opportunity to. And you know, make acquisitions to, to to grow as well as growing organically. And they um, seem they seem to be really cheap. I mean, I was looking at the actual multiple EV EBIT. They're only on about nine times and twelve times PER, and, and they've got a shed load of cash as well. Yeah, so. no, this, this, this is a business which, you know, at, at points in, in its in, in in its history over the last few years, has traded at you know twenty plus times PE multiples, and yeah, and. Yeah, and Based on the quality of the business and the growth of its, uh, uh, the growth potential it has, you know, it could easily do that again. I think you know, it had a period, the last two, couple of years, where it was going through an investment phase and mm. you know, putting cost into the business to, to drive scalability, both in terms of people and, and systems. And so the profit growth has been sort of more muted than it had been historically, which I think has you know, had resulted in the business, I guess, getting a bit forgotten and being derated. Um, you know the, the two acquisitions they've just made, um, the the balance sheet resources they've got, and you know, the fact that they've done that investment now, so they have the scalability to to, to really push forward. I think means we're now on to a sort of next phase of growth for the company. And you know, I, I agree. I think that the valuation multiples look look very cheap if you believe the growth opportunity. Yeah, and also I guess because of this, this sort of new technology with with sort of social media. With sort of you know your Twitter and LinkedIn and with greater information flows to people to make their own investment decisions, but also that long-term trend in terms of you know the closing of defined benefit pension schemes and also mm-hmm. the government supporting new new tax, yeah. you know the, the ISAs and the LISAs and all this sort of stuff. It, you know, increasingly the man in the street wants to control his own money, don't they? Yeah. And, uh, so um, yeah, they should. I, mean, they should. And I think I think it's a you know, it's a it's a it's a long term trend. It's not changing. You know, yeah. I think there's good tailwinds in that space. Uh, yeah. And you mentioned fintel, which is another one we yes. we're excited about, which we 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 invested in for the first time last year. It's been listed. It was called Simply Biz. Yes, um, it changed its name recently. Um, yeah, it's a business we've tracked for a long time, but but last year it was just a, a great opportunity to, from an entry price perspective to to get into. You know, the next phase of its its story mm. that was really really cheap valuation and um, the, the business was you know it was impacted by covid in terms of activity levels in the sector um and because it had made an acquisition in 2019 it had um, it had leverage and balance sheet leverage and i think the market really went off any companies which were sort of perceived to be over geared in the covid period so so the shares got derated and that was our sort of entry point we felt Cash generation would be really strong, and the debt would come down quite rapidly. Um, and it has, you know, I, 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 th- I think this is an extremely exciting opportunity because so Sim- simply biz, oh, the old simply biz originally was a network that provided yeah. compl- outsourced compliance services and uh, effectively 
aggregation, buying aggregation to IFAs, particularly the long tail small IFAs, to allow them to sort of effectively compete with the bigger bigger groups yeah. in, in that sector. Um, and over time, it's evolved into not just providing compliance services and, and so that uh, better prices for, on, on product, but also uh, software. It's a resale software that um, allows them to manage their businesses. And, and ultimately, it's a sort of technology and services provided to that space, but not now, not just to the sort of one man band, small IFAs, but actually right across even to the large consolidators. Mm-hmm. And then they bought a business called DeFacto yes. in 2019, DeFacto. Is a research and and data provision business, and that is the you know, that was a that was a big bet on technology and digital transformation in that sector, which is you know a big a big feature, um, and, and and actually it's a sector which has sort of probably been a bit of a laggard in terms of technology development compared to some others, and so de facto gives them the platform which allows them to really sell some quite sophisticated data analytics both to the IFA and sort of mm. fund buyer segment to, to give them insight into how they're, how they're procuring and, and kind of what other people are doing, what best practices. Yeah. And then also to sell that same data in different form to the product providers to help them to optimize you know, how they position their products to, to make them more attractive to be acquired. And so if you get that right, you know, they're on a journey there, but if, if you get that right, you are improving the quality of earnings of the business by by driving SaaS revenue, software mm. service revenue and, and recurring subscription revenue. You're also driving you know, growth in the business because of new revenue streams. But then you're also, I think, you know, the, the business has potential for a material re-rating because if it's if it's valued not as a IFA services business, but as a as a genuine platform. digital platform business, then it can it could be valued on a much higher multiple than it currently is. So that that's the bet we're taking. Um, we've done a lot of work. We've got an internally sort of operating partner who's a technology expert, uh, ex Microsoft. Um, he he used to run Microsoft Digital Transformation Consultancy business across Europe. So a really sophisticated sort of understanding of technology. So we got him involved to sort of speak to the CTO and the COO of, of, of Fintel to really kind of help us kick, kick the, the tires team. yeah and 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 you know, and, and fortunately gave it a thumbs up and also you know, is able to introduce the company to, to some interesting contacts that in his network that can help them to kind of on the journey they're going on so mm. you know, as i said we've got high hopes for that opportunity yeah and i think the margins are pretty good they're over 25 percent operating margin so you're yeah. right that's it's scalable isn't it and it can, so the, tar- uh, the, tar- the target is for that to in- increase quite substantially because of the SaaS and, and data yeah. revenue, which are even higher margin than that yeah, and the and the XP um, S yeah. pensions. I mean, again, I mean that's on a really good valuation. It's on about twelve times EV EBIT, and you look mm-hmm. at that for sort of like a high growth business. That I mean, admittedly, it probably does sort of more advisory, but um, if it can move up to all recurring revenue streams and and a platform a bit like FinTel, then uh, then it's that right. that's only going up as well, I guess. I mean, XP S is so it, it's it's. A- Quite a specialist business. It's an, effectively an actuarial consultancy. Yeah. So it's it's, uh, it's in that particularly focused on defined be- defined benefit pensions market, which mm. you might think, no, that why would you want to be there? That's Every, everybody market. yawns when you talk about defined benefits. But, 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 actually, it's, it's, but everybody it's, needs it. Yeah, you know, it's a huge it's a huge industry. There's a, a hell of a lot of assets out there, and, and the pensions that exist now, you know, the, they they are the, the trustees of those pension funds require advice you know actuarial valuations you know, there's a recurring element to what what they do and they're going to require that for the next uh, 40, yeah. 50, 60 years where yeah. as, those, as those pensions sort of turn into being paid out to to to, to pensioners and so there's a, there's a big it's a protected market i.e it's not really very correlated to the wider economic cycle which is attractive at the moment given yes. the uncertainty we've got um that it's it's dominated by some of the some big international players like Mercer and Towers Watson, etc. Yeah. Um, and you know, there's the you know, there's there's regulatory scrutiny as you referenced earlier on in that market. Um and XPS is setting itself up to be the leading second tier player after those big international players. And and they're and they're doing a good job. They're taking market share. They're, they're they're recruiting people from some of those big businesses which have been going through their own consolidation and therefore you know you, you always have fallout in terms of individuals that don't want to be part of that sort of global behemoth um and and you know it's growing sort of mid to high single digits margins should expand as it grows and like you said it's, I mean, it's on, on p of 13 
five uh, percent dividend yield, which to me sort of is, is extremely cheap relative to the opportunity and 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 the defensiveness of the company. Yeah, good. Yeah, I agree. Another one with a bold sort of like um, title is Alexia International. I think they're sort of like yeah. a, a strategic management consultant. So I don't know if they compete against some of the big boys like. I don't know McKinsey or Bain or some of the accountants and stuff like that, but uh, yeah. But well, well, I mean, I guess you, you you know some of these guys, do you as well? No, I, I, I mean, we 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 met them sort of in in the sort of early stages of the IPO process. Um, yeah, you know, it's a specialist consultant. I mean, they they would they wouldn't like me describing it quite like this, but I, I sort of think of it as a a digital transformation consultancy. So right, you know, they, they are. Combining some strategy consultancy, so competing with McKinsey, Bain, etc., but also sort of technology implementation, and, and so competing with Accenture and Capgemini and, and yeah, those okay. kind of guys. Um, so it's a bit of a mix. It's got you know, absolute blue chip customers, Fortune 500, Fortune 100 type customers, um, and you know, they're just really, really niche focused on on this implementation of technology, technology as a as a Kind of key strategic tools for, yeah, for, yeah. for 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 businesses, and, and it's just everywhere. And that's why we why we hired the ex Microsoft guy into into our business mm. because you know, it, this isn't just about investing in tech companies. It's just, this is a thing which you know, covers all industries and a different different pace. So uh, Elixir, you know, they've got a massive tailwind into what they're doing. They they listed because um, it was a founder led business, and they wanted to find a way to to equity to, to sort of provide equity incentives to. What you know, the kind of inverted commas partner level people in their businesses, and to incentivize new people to join and to make bolt on acquisitions with equity as part of the consideration for the, for the acquisition. So uh, it's, it's it's done brilliantly since we uh, invested. It was an IPO, sort of end of the summer last year, mm. it was, so probably this time last year actually. Um, and it, I think it floated at two pounds seventeen. It's now five pounds eighty. Oh, okay, um, well done. <laughs> you know, it, but, but but we still think is the you know this, this yeah. is a, this it, it's had the, the re-rating, but it's a, it's a really really strong earnings growth driver because you know, both from acquisition and from, and from organic growth because you know, this is a a huge theme across multiple sectors that it, again it's going to be you know, it's going to be a tailwind for five to ten years I would have thought mm. so you know, we think they're, well, they're 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 really well positioned. Yeah, I think they're going to be rushed off their feet doing the digitization. I mean, everybody's doing it, aren't they? Like crazy, yeah, exactly. you know, and they carry on. But perhaps one which is sort of like uh, would less spring to mind is um, is sort of kitchen of cleaning is 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 a filter which does sort of like uh, I think it's sort of um, what's it called uh, fryer management systems and uh, yeah, and, that, and and drainage. But it's run by it. It's sort of like a. I think it's the sort of the founder, you know, sort of like or the son of the founder, Jason Sayers, I think. And yeah. uh, they seem to have a, a mix between us of their own sort of like um, uh, services and then franchise services, mm-hmm. franchise abroad in the UK and stuff. Yeah. And I guess they're reopening now is that they're coming back as uh, as fish, mm-hmm. well, not so much fish and chip shops, but restaurants and uh, supermarkets and stadia yeah. all, all get back and kfcs all get back to sort of like serving their clients on premise mm-hmm. yeah absolutely yeah. filter it, it, it's it's a very niche business but it's a yeah. lovely, really lovely business when, when i first heard about it and, and and i was told you know this is a this is a deep fat fryer oil filter <laughs> I'm, I'm probably not going to like that but actually you know it, the business model is really attractive the the, 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 the chief exec jason is, says uh, really, really dynamic. You know, I think yes. really, really high quality. Um, and you know, this the, the core franchise business is, um, you know, it's being driven by you know, what they're really good at is attracting and uh, and and then supporting entrepreneurial uh, uh, franchisees who want to grow their business, so they can grow on the back of their franchisees growing. They pick the right yeah. ones, and these so they 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 rent them the, these this piece of kit, which is effectively <laughs> putting it really crudely it's like a sort of vacuum cleaner with a with an oil fil- with a miniaturized oil filter in it on, on, on wheels and they, they and, and the uh the this guy the franchisees will have guys in vans who will go around to a conference center or a stadia or a kfc or wherever, wherever it is as you say and you know, they'll go on a weekly basis maybe go two or three times a week depending on the uh, on, on the mm. customer uh, and they will use this piece of kit to suck the oil out of a deep back fryer Put it through the filter and then put it back in again. And that 
prolongs the life of the oil. So there's a return on investment for you know, just not having to, to replace your oil so frequently. It, it improves the quality of the, the, the food because the oil's cleaner rather than yeah, being yeah. dirty. Um, and it's good for the environment because when, when it finally does uh, end, end up needing to be replaced, they'll take it off their hands and then they'll, they'll sort of either set it for biofuel or they'll dispose of it in a sort of environmentally friendly way. And so some of the big corporations, in particular in the US, um, you know, they've had massive fines, million, multi-million dollar fines for mm. dumping waste oil into the drain system and then yeah. it ends up in, in the waterways. And that can, the, the EPA regulator in the, in the US can actually track Trace that back, and 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 and, and it's, it's, not, it's not it's not just in the US because you probably heard those things. There are huge fatbergs underneath sewers in the yeah, US. Yeah, yeah. Even even in sort of like OAP areas like Sidmouth in Devon mm-hmm. as well, sort of like huge sort yeah. of like consolidations of, of of waste fat, isn't it? Yeah. So so look, it's, it's doing something which might it might be sort of niche and not very attractive, but it's you know, it's necessary and it's it's, it's, it's and, and the business model because it's recurring. You know, we'll come yeah. and do this once, twice, three times a week. It's a recurring revenue model. The franchisees, uh, you know, so it's a low capital intensity model because the franchisees buy the kit and buy the bands, and, and so they they've got the capital risk. Um, and and so it's you know really cash generative. You know, it, it, um, and ultimately, you know, look at your, your Domino's Pizza or whatever. The, the, that franchise model, you know, I think, is a really really attractive business model because yeah. Because it's low low capital intensity, high cash generation, high return on capital, and you know ultimately that can support really attractive dividends as well as being a, a sort of you know, reinvesting some of the capital into, into growth. So you know, it, it's a small business, it's niche. Clearly, it was impacted by COVID um, because but it's coming back, it, isn't it? His end customer base you know, had a lot of their sites closed or whatever, but it's it's really coming back now. Yeah, and also the secular tailwinds behind this in terms of regulation. And cleanliness in in restaurants is only going to help. It's going to get tighter, so they're going to, yeah. more more and more people if they want to operate are going to need professional sort of like uh, cleaners. Now you've got a number of other sort of like very interesting reopening trades. You've got City Pub Group, yeah. uh, Loungers, and yeah. Ten Entertainment. Do you want to mm-hmm. talk us through those? Because uh, obviously yeah. it's quite that's, that's quite interesting. Because I mean I'm just doing my man on the street here. You've had this huge sort of pent up demand. Yeah. You had a huge surge at the start. Pubs and restaurants were just yeah. chock a block. But actually, that seems to have come out. But you've still got lots of pent up demand for other services. I mean, overseas holidays and stuff like that. How yeah. do you see that sort of playing through? For I mean, you've got City Pub, which is obviously you, you've got the name on the t- on the top. Mm-hmm. It's in pubs in cities. You've got lounges, which is cafes and restaurants mm-hmm. in in sort of cities and stuff. And then you've got ten pin bowling with ten entertainment. So mm-hmm. uh, yeah. So we've, and, and then the other the other ones we've got in that leisure space we've got the gym group low cost gyms and we've got yeah. we've got Everyman Cinemas which is the, the sort of boutique uh, cinema chain so you know we pre pre the pandemic you know, one of the areas that we really liked in consumer was low ticket experiential leisure so yes you know, part, part of where you know relatively uh, small amounts of money. Um, so relatively economically sort of resilient and playing into that experiential trend so people wanting to have experiences rather than to buy stuff mm. so you know that, that, that those those companies all the ones i mentioned all the ones you, you mentioned you know, we had existing investing investments in prior to covid obviously all of them had were, were severely impacted by the lockdowns because yeah you know, many of them were, were forced to be closed and therefore had no revenues coming in so all of them were forced to really hunker down, focus on cash, focus on on costs, and and you know, try to try to sort of get through the difficult period. All of them raised uh, new equity capital, sort of mm. spring summer of last year, um, you know, in order to to ensure their balance sheets were you know, extremely resilient, and therefore you know they could a trade through a protracted lockdown, but also that they would have capital to invest when things reopened to be able to sort of start get kickstart growth again. Um, and in, in all of those cases, we think the high quality businesses, business models, high quality management teams, you know, with with the fundraisings they did, strong balance sheets. And you know, ultimately, if you believe that COVID sort of goes away eventually, and or, or we, we return to sort of normal economic patterns, then you know, all of them have, we believe, long uh, multi year growth opportunities. So. Uh, you know, the, the COVID period actually gave you the opportunity to invest in these these kind of companies at 
very very low multiples of yeah you know, if you believe earnings recover then you know you're, you're, you're paying sort of three four five times recovered earnings for businesses that you know, pre-pandemic would be sort of where the whole business would be being bought by private equity for double digit EBITDA multiple so mm. if we felt there's this you know even if even if we got it wrong in terms of how quickly things recovered we felt the margin of safety there was really you know, very very significant um, yeah. So you know, we, we've we've taken we've got five different things. So we're all in we're sort of I guess diversifying our exposure yes. amongst different sort of sub niches, but all of them we think are you know, really attractive long term opportunities. And and actually, so ironically, the, the the COVID period has improved the competitive position of these publicly listed companies because they've got mm. the capital and the balance sheet. Um, independents might not not have had access to, so actually they they've fared better than some of their independent competitors, um, which means uh, uh, there is an opportunity to grow because it's less competitive, or there's opportunities to acquire um, some independents who've got, got themselves into trouble. Um, and then secondly, the property environment is is significantly better because uh, the, the 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 high street's been decimated, and uh, you know, that that was kind of trend anyway, but. You know, the the deals that some of these businesses have been able to get on new sites are just sort of fantastically better than they were in 2019 or 2018. Um, yeah. So you know, you've got this. You know, ironically, you've got this, these businesses which have been hugely impacted short term, but suddenly have you know, a much better competitive environment, and property and rollout environment than they ever did before. Plus, the, plus their cheaper valuations and the balance sheets are stronger. So yeah, you know, that, that feels pretty attractive to me. And just on the sort of the, the consumption, let's just sort of like. You know, with sort of the pub trade, and also like with the restaurant trade. Yeah. I mean, you and even the and the cafes and stuff. I mean, everybody during lockdown bought a sort of bread making machine and started <laughs> cooking more at home, and also uh, the coffee. I've, I've, I've used my bread making machine which we bought once. <laughs> oh, have you? Oh, okay. <laughs> but I mean, what 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 you seem to have seen? I mean, uh, in Birmingham anyway, is that you've had that huge peak of of people enjoying themselves and, and everybody said it's going to last until christmas and actually it seems to have normalized faster than the most people anticipated to a certain extent um which which would then sort of like you, you sort of like so well going forward has the pandemic actually changed consumers behavior because it certainly seems to have changed it with takeaways if you just believe and also cinema chains stuff mm -hmm. like that it's sort of like a difficult one is it ever going the things is every, everything going to return to to what it was, or is a certain thing going to be returning less than others? I'm guessing. Um, very tricky question. Crystal, I think, uh, crystal ball, I guess. Yeah, isn't no, it? I, I, I think undoubtedly there will be changes to people's behaviour, but you know, the, the, these are huge markets, and people yes. want to go out and do things. And you know, what I think this has really done, in there, and and any crisis like this, sort of typically will sort out the high quality operators from the average quality operators and you know, the, the high quality experience from the poor or the average quality experience. So you, mm. you know, I, I think, and all, all these businesses will sort of fall into this category, that people will always be happy to go out and pay a sensible amount of money for a good experience. Yes. They might, not, they might, they might think twice about spending you know, 120 quid to take their family out to a, an average... Pizza casual dining pizza restaurant which, which, yeah. which doesn't give them anything different but you know, do they want to go to an everyman cinema where it's a really you know it's a better experience than a view or a cine world where you can kind of you know it, it, it's not all about the blockbuster it's about you know having yeah. a nice time and socializing as well as as well as seeing a decent film and in an attractive environment where it's a bit more comfortable you can have a glass of wine but you know i think there's 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 a there's, there's a market for that and you know, this is not a huge company this has got you know, yeah, yeah. Sites, not not 300 so i think it's it's got you know room to grow and i think yeah that that's probably of, of the of the five that we're invested in i'd say that's that's probably at the slower end of the recovery curve mm. compared to you know, something like lounges is you know it's trading it's life for life so, uh, up significantly versus 2019 so pre-pandemic so they're they're obviously trading their socks off despite everything yeah. um you know with, with, with every man i think it's a bit slower and this film slate does affect that i think when when you see uh, the Bond film actually come out into the cinemas. That's that's the point when when they're going yes. to really see things take off again. The rub the rubber hits the road, doesn't it? Yeah. Areas now that are sort of like less than well, not not exactly slow. They're absolutely on fire, which are sort of sectors. Staffing staff line obviously has just gone mm -hmm. obviously bonkers, and likewise with the housing industry, with Belvoir 
um, that you've got both of those. You want to talk us through? Because, I mean, I, I looked at staff line sometime and you, and you needed to be brave. And it's obviously proved very, really well, you know, really worked out yeah. well for you because they were suffering under an amount of debt having gone through a series of acquisitions. Perhaps, yeah. you know, not, you know, they were more concentrated on M&A rather than that, that operational integration and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, but but the shares seem to have done well. They've reduced the debt. And uh, as I say, the staffing industry has just gone gone crazy at the moment. Yeah, no, so stuff. I mean, it's, it's a business we've known for a really long time. We we mm. we backed the business. I mean, in my in the same or some of the same funds, but in my previous uh, employer, Living Bridge, which is a private equity firm, um, where, where the, myself and the team sort of spun out, yeah. to join Gresham. Um, no, we Living Bridge actually backed Staffline before IPO, and then IPO it in onto AIM in 2004. So there's been a sort of corporate. <laughs> Uh, association yes. for, for for a really long time, um, and we backed the previous previous sort of chief exec sort of minus two. Um, you know, we we'd done very well out of the investment, and we progressively sort of uh, exited through the market. You know, and, yeah, shaved and, down more than more than got you know, got our cost back, and, and and a lot more besides. But before it all kind of went a bit wrong, and so there was a chair, there was a CEO change. Um, there was issues with acquisition and and integration and, and a few other things, which the law uh, was a bit of a perfect storm in 2019, which mm. the business right on the back foot. Uh, the balance sheet was weak. Um, uh, COVID ironically sort of helped them because they got big support, government support in terms of VAT deferrals and things like that. So actually, mm. so so, so yes. what you might expect, they, the, the 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 cash flow and balance sheet position was improved uh, um, relative to what it might otherwise have been. Um, and uh, you know, it, it, we we supported a sort of major change of of, uh, of the board and the senior management team. Um, and we backed the uh, a, a new chairman, Ian Lawson, who I think has done an absolutely exceptional job in gripping hold of a very difficult situation. Um, you know, a, a business that had sort of you know, got, was a bit uh, you know, com- commercially, its customer relationships were okay, but it was you know, it, as you say, it had had huge debt, um, which was really hampering its ability to, 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 to move forward. Plus, yeah. COVID, it's got a training business, which was decimated by COVID. It's got a, 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 a staffing business. People plus, isn't it? Yeah. People plus, yeah, um, which is, is recovering now. Um, and then it's got a staffing business, which you know, some bits have done well and some bits have done, done less well because of COVID. So, um, you know, it was, it's, the important thing is it's got a good market position in that blue collar, sort of big, large scale blue collar uh, staffing provision and it's a it's a high quality operator with with blue chip customers um so we knew there was something you know we knew we had something there which was which which it could build on just the balance sheet was was sort of getting in the way so ian you know, he, he did a great job of uh, you know, getting the, the business into a decent shape getting the people getting the team into uh, into a decent shape recruited albert ellis initially as a, a non-exec director and then uh, he, he used to be the CEO of Harvey Nash, if you remember that, and mm. and, and then and then Albert sort of agreed to become full time chief executive, and uh, and so so now the team's in place, the board's in the right place, and then they did a fundraising to effectively sort of take the balance sheet out of the out of the, uh, out of the mm. equation. So That's the, right, yeah. Which we which we participated in and backed, and you know, so now I think the business is you know, teams there, strategies there. Market positions there, balance sheets there, so you know it should now be in a position where it can 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 grow attractively and sort of get back on the front foot. Yeah, and what about um, Belvoir? I mean, that seems to have done really well because obviously it's a let, it's a franchise sort of like estate yeah. agent lettings business that yeah. again has has gone to the moon, I think, because obviously yeah, the house I mean, is again going back to my comments on filter, 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 and Belvoir, both franchise businesses, and that's mm. a business model I think is really attractive from an investor's point of view because. Is capital like your franchisees do the growing for you? They, they do the hard yards, and you support them, and and that that means it's highly cash generative business model, high returns, and that supports attractive dividends, and that's exactly what you get with with Belvoir. So you know, it's a it's a state agency business, but franchised, um, and it's been a consolidator, so it's acquired other other chains, um, but it, it's it's done that in a, in a cash generative and measured way. Um, it, it's focused on it does sales and lettings, but it's predominantly letting. So the majority of the business is in letting. Yeah, sixty percent, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, which is a higher quality uh, uh, recurring revenue. Quality perspective, it's you know, it's less cyclical. 
is more visible and it's recurring in nature. So, so that, that gives you a really good sort of basis for the business. And then you know, the sales, you know, they're, they're sort of jam on top. So, you know, and we've, we've had uh, you know, huge pent up demand, which I think has been driven by sort of several years post the Brexit referendum of the housing market being depressed. Mm. Then you've had, a, then you have the, 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 the election results sort of in, in uh, December 19, which sort of threatened to, open, to, to sort of kickstart the housing market and then COVID happened. So you had a sort of double pent up demand because of the first lockdown. And, and then you also had the phenomenon that, you know, all sorts of reasons why uh, the housing market sort of had support, but you know, you have obviously had government support for, for uh, um, in terms of stamp duty, but actually that probably wasn't the most important factor. No. You just had this Brexit pent up demand, lockdown pent up demand, people spending so much time in their own homes, they, uh, they either wanted to a second home, they wanted to move out of the city, they were getting divorced, so there were all sorts of factors that... that and that, unbelievably you know, competitive mortgages. Yeah, 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 plus, plus, ex, plus extreme cheap mortgages. So you know, pretty much a price war in terms of the, the, yeah. from the banks in terms of mortgage rates. So you've just got this perfect storm of you know, positive trading conditions. And you know, Belvoir is a business which you know, it, it really hunkered down in the middle of lockdown thinking you know, they, they might you know, put people on furlough. They thought they might have to you know, they, they really sort of cut back mm. extensively. But actually trading picked up really, really rapidly and you know, they were able to repay all the furlough money um, you know, pretty pretty quickly, and uh, you know they, they suspended their dividend. But then they not only did they restart the dividend, they paid a catch up dividend to, to uh, sort of compensate people for the dividend they missed in, in, uh, in the middle of lockdown. So you know, really attractive business, you know, but it's a huge market. So I, I, even though there is some cyclicality, I think there's still good opportunities for the business to grow sort of on a, on a through the cycle sort of view. Yeah, and a couple of sort of, sort of like tech plays that are sort of very small and probably off the beaten track, but have got a lot of potential. And haven't really well, one of them hasn't really sort of like benefited. Well, one of them is Truefin, which has has got you know basically I think does sort of like factoring software mm-hmm. for um, yeah. for the supply chain. Has also got a partnership with Lloyd's to help early payment for for, yeah. for that. Because and then you've also got um, uh, Roslyn Data Service, which I think has does big data stroke um uh, savings and out well, basically cost saving benefit analysis mm-hmm. on, on yeah. their on supply chain and also some custom software but they're both really still compared to the software platforms they're still really cheap well, i think i think they both sort of get a really good examples of where you know, particularly in the microcap space mm. businesses that aren't very well known where they trade at a discount because yeah they're not, well they're not well researched they're not well known and they're maybe at the moment a bit a little bit too small for Kind of your 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 larger institutional investors to get involved in them. So, mm. you know, but there's the opportunity. That's that's one of the inherent sort of structural opportunities in microcap investing is that you've got yeah. you know, these uncovered. You can uncover these sort of little uncovered uh, unknown gems, which if they're successful and grow, when they get to a certain size, suddenly people start to, sort of getting interested. They, they 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 look at them and and then they get a real kicker from a re rating. So that's what we're hoping for in both of these these these, these opportunities. True, true fin. That's really a sort of quite quite a special situation. It, it yes. was a sort of spin out from um, a, a hedge fund, Arrowgrass, which which kind of went we well, got closed down. So um, they had all this kind of fintech investment, mm. um, some of which was spun out into into Truefin. It's got four businesses now, uh, and you you sort of describe some of what what they do. But for for me, the the so opportunity there's there's two really small businesses, and then one medium size and one with big potential. Um, the, the, there's, there's a sort of business Virtus, which is doing business loans to YFAs. Yes. Um, there's, there's Oxygen, which is providing sort of invoice supply chain finance for local authorities. Um, it, it's uh, the Sotago, which is a sort of SME software and lending and, and sort of, uh, I, I guess, credit scoring uh, platform. Yeah. Yeah. That's and the one they, being trialed by Lloyd's, yeah, isn't that it? That's being trialed by Lloyd's, which, if, if successful, you know, could, could be rolled out across Lloyd's. Um, as, as the platform which they they sort of used to ha- help support their SME lending business, so that that could be huge. And if if it, if it is successful, it's likely Lloyd's are probably going to try and buy them. Or you know, yes, you know, <laughs> you know, if, we, if we if we're lucky, then maybe Barclays and Lloyd's will compete to buy them. Yeah, yeah. you're right, absolutely. Yeah. So so I I think those three businesses you know are you know, they they support valuation probably in excess of the current market cap. 
And then you've got the, the what I think is the jewel in the crown business called PlayStack, which is focused on the on the video game sector. Oh, gaming, that's and, right, yeah. Yeah, and it's it, it, it provides, it's both a games developer, it's, it's an advertising technology business for games, so allowing advertisers to put games in play in a way which is sort of not intrusive to the gameplay and you know, and and you know it's, it's a bit of a holy grail because the number of eyeballs and the and the interactivity you've got with 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 gaming but trying to sort of put, put advert, adverts into that environment without messing up the the, the the experience is quite tricky and they're they're doing it it's a bit like um myriad which is another listed company mm. which we're doing in terms of of in video advertising but they're doing in game in the gaming sector which arguably is more interesting um and then they're also um, providing an invoice finance platform so that games developers, independent games developers, can effectively factor their debts, uh, their, 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 wow. their debtors with Apple or Google. So you've got blue chip, uh, um, blue chips of counterparties, but they just want the money quicker so they can reinvest in acquiring customers. Mm -hmm. So, so again, they 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 sort of provide that opportunity. Um, so I think all three of those bits are, are really quite exciting and place that you know could be a really valuable standalone business so ultimately you know who knows if this will happen or exactly when but i think probably the likely sort of long-term play here is that three initial businesses ultimately are divested for an attractive price and the cash is reinvested in growing place that which could it could, could be a really exciting standalone business yeah it's only on trade next year's uh, sales it's only trading on two times sales so uh, mm -hmm. and the and fintech businesses are five times plus aren't they so uh, my, my private equity colleagues that you know, some of the really exciting high growth fintech plays you know you could be paying 10 times sales yeah so, easily yeah 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 and then and then with with, with rosslyn data tech like, that's just trading on i've had a new chief executive paul watts i think it is who yeah. i've actually spoken to he's a terrific guy um, but that's only trading on 1.5 times sales i guess the it's been one of those things which has been a long term ha long time happening and Hopefully, with the digitization of business, it, it will happen over the next 12, 18 months. Yeah, look, we, we, we think this is a high quality business. It's high, you know, it's, it's SaaS business. It's got great customers, you know, Blue Chip, Johnson, Matthew, mm. Coca Cola, Alan Overy, people like that. Yeah. yeah and, um, you know, this data analytics uh, capability they've got is, you know, is only <laughs> going to become more, more, more sort of in demand from, from big companies, from all companies. Mm. So we, we think it's, it's just one of those businesses that has been overlooked due to its size. We we yeah. took the opportunity to participate in the fundraising and then also to acquire a material stake in the market. So we now own twenty nine percent of the company, and um, you know, so so we we are very bullish on it. Um, and we've been we've been engaging quite heavily with the chairman. That we were involved in in, in that. Recruitment. James Appleby, I think it is, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, so, yeah. so we've been been heavily involved with him. We've been using our a technology operating partner, the Microsoft guy I mentioned earlier on. We're using our our head of talent, who's who's helped with the process to, uh, to bring on the new chief exec, um, and we just think this is a it's, a it's an attractive growth story. But as you say, at one point five times EV so, sale, you know, it's dirt cheap. You know, there's a massive arbitrage between that and a similar business in the private market where VCs are investing at five times, six times, seven times sale. And yeah. so, you know, if if it does, if the stock market doesn't start to realise the value here, then you know, there's you know, it's likely that 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 uh, private equity or trade would would yeah. see the equity. and there's also there's also a um, a customs management piece of software that they bought really cheaply, which should only benefit from Brexit as well, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, and, uh, so then, so they're, you know, they're, they're entrepreneurial, they're agile, and that's that's what you do get with these small businesses. Is, mm. you know, in, in more difficult market environments, they can pivot in a way that some of the big companies can't, and that means that they you know you, you can. These period, I found the same thing in 2008, 2009. You, you know, you, you, those the businesses that sort of where where the management team really demonstrated their credentials. That you know, then you've got a really long period of, of attractive growth because you've just got high high quality companies, the ones that sort of rise to the surface in, in yeah. a difficult time. I, I must admit, and also just hearing you, I love the whole sort of active type of you know sort of like portfolio management by uh, by Gresham because. Uh, I mean, that's what you need, you know, in terms of helping steering and developing small micro businesses through the 
the difficulties not only of the of just sort of like getting their businesses in operation, putting in best practice, but also sort of just just the, the trials and tribulations of the market when they're just ignored as well and just so just seeing through we, it. We sort of describe it as taking a private equity approach to public markets, and what we mean yeah. by that is not focusing just on shares and share prices and the, but mm. businesses really trying to understand the business fundamentals, you know, being disciplined on valuation, um, but also being active, engage, engaged investors. So being being often the biggest investor in the company and being the first port of call when they need capital to do something, when they want to acquire a business or or invest to grow, being you know ha- helping them to uh, introducing high quality people to help with board composition, getting involved in the management centres to ensure that you know, there's a good alignment of interest with us as shareholders. Uh, and and making introductions to our network where we've got high quality people who can help them and support their strategy and hopefully if we do that you know with the right mindset and we we've, we've picked the right businesses they're open to us doing that and it's a win-win for everyone because you know we we we, we make money out of the shares that they, yeah. they get the high quality people introductions which can help them yeah you sound like chris mills from um from like the <laughs> oh good i think it is um yeah. and then, then just finally hive um which is, I think, is a corporate event, both on digital yeah. and online. I mean, are you starting? Are they starting starting to now see businesses wanting to do face to face sort of exhibitions and events and stuff like that? Is that is that part of the yeah. business now starting to? Uh, so, so, so Hive Hive is a business that uh, an investment I inherited when I took over as manager of strategic equity capital, which is yeah, okay. where we won, won the mandate. Um, and I was initially a bit sceptical because, you know, clearly it was you know, definitely in that category of businesses that have been yep. impacted by COVID, but also yep. there's a structural shift going on in the market uh, towards digital. And I think, you know, what, what they've done really well, I mean, one thing which has really helped them on a relative mm. basis, that they're one of the few businesses in that space that were, uh, you know, very sort of significantly insured. So, when uh, and the pandemic, oh, okay. yes. pandemic sort of clauses in their in their insurance yeah. policy, so they actually got paid out significant sort of tens and tens and tens of millions uh, for for events that didn't happen, which has sort of helped them from a cash flow perspective when when some of their sort of business has been impacted. Um, and you know, in that sector, for me, it's all about you know, there's been a big change in the space, and there's a lot of more digital sort of. Uh, uh, provision of of of, of uh, events, which they've had to embrace during during the pandemic. But actually, if you've got the top tier event in a segment or in a geography for in a particular mm. area, th- you know, it, it's the second and third tier ones which are going to you know, people won't go to and, and corporates won't sign off the budget for in more difficult environment. Yeah. But there is always the event in a particular space which um, which. which you sort of have to go to obviously people couldn't go to them in in some geographies over the last sort of 12 18 months but that's starting to open up again and it's sort of varying by geography but because of the insurance payouts they've got they've been able to navigate that quite well and i think it's a good you know, this was this was a FTSE 250 company not not that long ago so uh, i think you know, they've, they've got the assets they've invested in digital through the pandemic period partly by necessity and so they're in a good position to sort of see the recovery coming through now yeah, and uh, you've got there's an argument to play. We'll wait and see because obviously uh, we'll only test the time to a certain extent. But there's an argument in place. It's that you know the physical side will come back to a certain level. We get face to face business because they want to see their customers, they want to see their partners, and blah blah blah. But we also, if you dovetail that with a very good digital offering as well, yeah. more and more people can attend virtually along with physically so you get a greater income stream it could be yeah. not and then, not yeah, and then you get really good data on, on what yeah. people think as well, which is which is again is something you can then utilize to improve the service and and, and sort of you know, generate returns as well so yeah I, there, there is room in this that for for modern events businesses that are both sort of hybrid physical and and and, and digital and i think that that's where high sort of direction travel is yeah, well, I, I, I now understand just going full sort of circle, even though your portfolios have done really well over the last two years, I understand why you're now so, you know, sort of bullish on the stock market and micro cap and, uh, uh, and, uh, and such like uh, go, going forward. Where, where would be the best place for investors? If they want to invest in the, in the Gresham funds, where would be the best mm-hmm. place for, for to contact you or contact the website or how yeah, best to I think all, all, all the information for all the all the strategies we've got is is on the strategic equity sort of page within the GreshamHouse.com website. Yeah. So 
uh, that's probably your sort of best port of call. And you can go in there depending on whether you're an advisor or retail or, or whatever. There, there's sort of different different routes you can take on the site, but all the information there, all the fact sheets and presentations, etc. So uh, that's where I would go. Yeah. All right. Okay. Well. Well. Brilliant. Well. Thanks very much for your time, Ken. Absolutely uh, delighted. I've learned to shed load in terms of sort of like uh, investing. So that's uh, that's really good. And uh, look forward in touching base again uh, probably early next year. Okay, well, thank you for having me. It's been uh, been good, good fun. So yeah, uh, all right. Take, take care. Cheers. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks, Ken. Bye.